Okay, guys, let's get started with the lecture today. You are in the Societal Challenges class, or at least I hope you are, because otherwise I'm wrong. Uh, you see me as a new face. My name is uh, Dr. Thomas Grund. I'm an associate professor at the School of Sociology, and we will have the pleasure just for one lecture. So after that, Mick Byrne is going to take over, and he will teach you two sessions about globalization. But today we have an introduction to globalization, and that's what you will have with me. Okay, but before we get started, I was asked to remind you guys that for the next tutorial, you're supposed to do this reading. You have the tutorial next week, and you have uh, this reading by Stiglitz to do, and you find it in Blackboard under the theme, under democracy and nation states and core reading. I didn't design this. If I would have designed this, I would have designed this in a more straightforward way, but here we are. So you find this under the theme, under the lecture, Democracy and Nation, which is one that Mick is going to give you guys next Thursday. And there you find this reading that you are supposed to read for the tutorial, right, in the preparation. And uh, just a little side note, you're out of experience. You take so much more out of these lectures when you do the readings in advance. And then you go to the lecture, and then it's a completely different experience. Because then suddenly you can talk about things, and the whole tutorial just reaches a different level. Right. So actually, in my lectures, I flip the classroom all the time. Actually, I have students do readings before every lecture, and I actually quiz them. And if you don't do it, you have a problem. So anyway, so that's sort of the reading. That's the announcement for this. So this is what we're going to talk about today. So this is about globalization. How exciting is that? Well, actually, it's a very, it's a very dramatic change that is going on in the world that, you know, sometimes we're not really aware of the amount of change that is actually happening around us, but it's actually the job of the social scientist and of the sociologist, I'm a sociologist, to step back and to look at that. And then suddenly things appear that are just crazy. And hopefully this is sort of what you're going to take out of this lecture today about the degree of globalization that we have around us, right? So I'll first talk about globalization in general, put it a little bit in a historical context, talk about origins of it, pros and cons, and then depending on whether we have time, I want to talk about globalization and Ireland. We are in Ireland after all, right? How this affects Ireland. Ireland happens to be a very globalized country. There are folks like me, you know, actually, I don't know. I lived in eight countries during the last 10 years. Uh, I did my education all over the world, worked at all kinds of places, and I don't think I'm an exception nowadays. I think that's just how it is. Yeah. And then at the end, we also have some challenges, let's see. Uh, if you have time for that. But before we get started, you know, I, before I came here, I just got a coffee, had a little chat with the barista, you know, what you do, just say hello, how is your day, and so on. So I asked, what is your daily brew? And apparently this is an Ethiopian brew that I have, right? And, you know, it's actually pretty incredible, the coffee comes from there. I don't know if you ever noticed, but then I kind of got this cup with these plastic lids. You know, I'm the kind of guy, I'm curious about things. So I'm kind of going there and I really investigate, right? As it turns out, almost all of these plastic lids that you get on these coffee mugs are produced by a company called Hutamaki, and they are from Finland, right? So actually, Finnish dominate the world market on plastic lids for those coffee mugs. That's kind of a little strange. So I thought about, hang on a moment. How is this, is this maybe a general thing? So actually this morning, you know, before I got into my jumper and my jeans and so on, I kind of actually looked at the labels. So actually my jumper comes from India. My jeans come from Pakistan. My shoes, my little sneakers, come from Indonesia. Well, my underwear comes from Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, actually my headphones come from Japan. Nice Sony headphones, they come from Japan. My phone, here I have it, it's a Motorola phone. Used to be an American company. Now it's bought by a Chinese company, Lenovo. And actually, most of the components in there are coming from China as well. Even though the software still comes, you know, there's the Android system, which is partly developed in the US. And actually, there are lots of different components in that phone that come from many different countries in the world as well, right? So actually, my glasses, I bought them originally in Germany. I had them reglassed in Canada. So I was wondering, God, where is all this stuff coming from? That's kind of crazy, right? And if you actually would... Do it tonight when you strip down into your PJs. Yeah? Just check out where this stuff is coming from. It's crazy. It's coming from all over the world. And that's just one example about clothes. But actually, when you talk, when you talk about food, it's kind of crazy that you go to the supermarket and you can get the salad from Kenya. And apparently, that salad is even is cheaper than the locally produced salad. 
How the fuck can that be? <laughs> yeah? That's really weird. And then you think about all the amount of energy that it takes to transport stuff. I don't know, huge ships, oil tankers, I don't know, flights, aircrafts, all this kind of stuff. Think about the consequences of that. Think about the footprint of that. Think about the amount of effort. And apparently it's still better for me to buy my salad at Lidl, which is where I go, and it's a salad from Kenya. So anyway, so globalization is on the rise. And it's not just something that I'm making up. So actually, first of all, let's define it. What do we mean with globalization? One definition is it's a process by which the world is becoming increasingly interconnected as a result of massively increased trade and cultural exchange. I was just talking about the trade so far. We'll talk about the cultural exchange in a second as well. And I was mentioning, you know, my clothes, where they come from. So actually, I did a bit of digging. And, uh, you know, actually, it's kind of crazy. You know, like they produce all over the world. Uh, H&M has factories in, I don't know, 20... This is like some old data. Probably it's, it's, it's different right now, you know. And actually, they change constantly all the time, which is even worse. Because you see, like, a jumper from, I don't know, wherever you buy your jumper, but actually, it could come from so many different places, and they change it all the time, wherever it's bloody cheapest. That's where this stuff is coming from, right? So... Companies have like factories nowadays all over the world. So to highlight that a little bit, I have a little video from the OECD, which kind of makes that point that I just made earlier about as well, but kind of puts it in, in a slightly different context. So let's see, hopefully, hopefully this works. Trade is the engine of the global economy. More people, more goods, and more services are crossing borders today than ever before. But trade has changed dramatically in the 21st century. Through much of history, a good produced in a country was largely made of parts sourced there. Today, products are composed of parts from all over the world. To fully understand trade, we have to measure the value added at each point in the process. Imagine China exports a $100 smartphone to the United States. China may have only produced $10 or $20 of the total value of that phone. The rest of it was imported from elsewhere. Graphic design from a California studio, computer code from programmers in France, a silicon chip from a factory in Singapore, precious metals mined in Bolivia. Trade improves competitiveness. Cheaper imports of parts and cheaper access to services bring benefits to consumers and companies alike. To realize the full potential, we need seamless border crossings, simpler customs procedures, sophisticated logistics, and more trade liberalization, especially in services. Okay, with the last ones, with, with the last ones you, you can debate these kind of things. You know, and actually, I'd like to invite you to encourage to kind of question these kind of things, right? So this is coming from the OECD, which sort of promotes like international trade. So uh, let's put our fingers down a little bit. What are we talking about? So international trade, you know, we can define it as the exchange of capital, goods, and services across international borders or territories. You know, and it's the exchange of goods and services among nations of the world. And you know, in most countries, you will measure this as a significant share of the gross domestic product. What is the gross domestic product? You might have heard about that. I hope that you heard about that. It's actually just a measure uh, for the monetary value of final goods and services that are being produced in a country. Right? It's not as hard to kind of pin that down. Like, I don't know, what is sort of like the value added being produced in a country, but the GDP tries to measure that. Right? It's like the, like the value added uh, that is being produced uh, in terms of monetary terms in a particular country. And now we can kind of put these two things together. You know, we can see actually how did actually GDPs evolve over the time, yeah, let's say over the last uh, 30 years or so, and how did international trade of that evolve over, over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so, uh, as, a, as, a, as a fraction of that. And uh, what we see is actually, you know, uh, um, trade, international trade uh, increased dramatically. So here, this graph, in order to read that graph, Think about 9080, whatever the value was in 9080, that's 100. There we go. It's just a fix, it's rescaled. And then you kind of see how it goes up. So basically, when it goes to 200, it means it doubled from 9080. Right? If it goes to 300, it tripled from 9080. Well, actually, it went up to almost 800 uh, in, 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 I don't know, from 9080 to, to 2016. 
Yeah, and surely if I would find the, I'm lazy, I couldn't find the numbers for 2018 yet, but if I would look at that, you know, we'd probably be above 800. So basically, the international trade, the amount of stuff that is being traded, I don't know, between countries was multiplied by a factor of eight in 30 years, 35 years. That's a massive, massive increase. You know, that's a, that's, that's a big change in a lifetime you know, that's going on. But it's not just about trade. You know, as I said earlier, or in our definition earlier, it's also about the cultural exchange of things, right? And also in social terms, we can think about globalization, uh, described as a level of interconnectedness between people uh, of the world and their lives, works, and families. And I mentioned earlier, you know, I lived in eight different countries in 10 years, and I don't know, I have friends now all over the world, you know, my family is back in Germany, and I'm actually, you know, I'm on, on WhatsApp with my mom. Yeah. Isn't that cute? And, and I think I'm not, an, I'm not an exception. I think this is just how it is nowadays. And probably it's the same thing for you guys too. You know people from all over the world. I remember the days where we used to have like, I'm not that old, but I still remember the days where you made an international phone call and you were just very quickly, within 10 seconds, you said, hello, hello, how are you? I was in fire. Okay, good, fine. Why? Because it was bloody expensive. Yeah? It was nothing about roaming, and nowadays, I don't know, uh, last summer I was, uh, I was traveling in, in Spain, and you know, I was just constantly on my unlimited internet, because that's just what my plan does nowadays. It's just roaming. Yeah, European Union, we are all queued together. There we are. So in social terms, we are much more connected, and when you kind of, I don't know, just go home and ask your parents about the people they knew outside of Ireland, or maybe even the people they knew outside of the country, the county that you are coming from. It's a different story. I bet you it's a different story from how your life looks like right now. Probably even already with amongst yourself. And nowadays, the international student numbers just skyrocket at UCD. Uh, there are lots of other reasons for that. Yeah? But I think it's a great development. Yeah? We kind of get diversity in the university. That's usually a good thing. But it's a massive, massive change. But also in cultural terms. You know, as a cultural phenomena, we have globalization. We exchange ideas and values among cultures. And, you know, there's very stupid things. Like nowadays, we watch all the blockbusters. And they are sort of blockbusters all over the world. It's not that, I don't know, there would be a movie. In a, sometimes there still are, you know. But it's really just a global market. They produce this for the global market. They produce this for the world. Right? And uh, especially with new technologies is where you see whatever is coming up. The memes pop up and bang. I don't know. They, these memes don't know any boundaries anymore. Right? You pick them up and they just spread globally. This is where we are. So our culture is much more connected than before. So what can we summarize so far? So we have increased international trade. Companies operating in more than one country nowadays. You know, like you mentioned, the example that I had with the different factories all over. Actually, this is nowadays company. They are present all over the world. There's a greater dependence on the global economy. We hadn't really talked about that, but you know, within the challenges, I don't know, when you think back about the uh, financial crisis, 2008, yeah? This was a global financial crisis. And there was, there was a reason why that was a global thing, because nowadays we are just so connected with each other. So if the Americans really fuck it up, yeah? That's sort of, or I don't know, if there's a trade war going on between China and America, you know, this is going to affect us at the end of the day, yeah? Or I don't know, or the Brits leaving the Brexit, I don't know, this is going to affect us, yeah? We don't know yet, yeah? But... Get ready for, I don't know, economists that I talked with, they say, okay, there are negative impacts for Ireland. It's going to happen. Uh, I have some slides more on that later. So worldwide recognition of brands. You go all over the world, and Coca-Cola has already been there. You go somewhere into the jungle. I remember a couple of years ago, I was in the jungle in Cambodia. It's a very nice experience. You go there, you know. It's pretty adventurous. And you, you think you're sort of like... Indiana Jones, you know, getting to that temple and Uncle Wat, you know, when you climb there. And then you kind of see, okay, there's already a guy selling, selling stuff and, I don't know, and there's a chair on that little stall and it has Coca-Cola written all over it. So bloody hell. You can't explore things anymore. Companies, people have been there already, worldwide. We are connected to each other. Okay. So let me put this now in a historical context, right? So now we zoom back a little bit. We've seen the present, where we are. Let's put that in a historical context. Is this a new phenomenon? Is this really something different? Is this something qualitatively different from how it used to be? Because globalization, you know, it's not a new thing. Uh, there has been the Silk Road back in the days. Yeah? It was a little slower to move goods from here to there. But they did move. 
uh, and you know they found this amazing stuff you know like I don't know stuff from the from the Far East suddenly showing up in some Viking settlements that they discover in Denmark and so on right and then they wonder how the hell did it travel there somehow it traveled somehow there was already global exchange happening at the time but to which degree did that happen so now I digged up some statistics where I'm using these these the statistics you see the sources below that kind of map out uh, the 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 share of the GDP, remember the GDP is like this, whatever is being produced in a country and so on, and it maps out how much of that is actually comes from exports and imports in, in countries all over the world, right? And what you see is that, you know, now you see the time and the x-axis starting in the 1500s and then going up to the 21st century, and you know, you see the spike, right? Especially during the last 50 years, you see how it actually really increases from around, I don't know, 15% of share in the GDP that is coming through import and export up to nowadays, I don't know, around 60%. So there is a qualitative difference. And these things really are integrated. And nowadays, companies, they cannot produce locally anymore. They cannot think about their local market anymore. Not like this, I don't know, uh, um, medium, small-sized family company and so on. They produce small little things, like little plastic things, or plastic cups, Hudamaki. Probably it was a family company, I don't know, yeah, at some day. But they are forced to either die or to produce for Ireland and the rest of the world those bloody lids for those paper cups. Why? Because otherwise the Chinese would just do it. Or I don't know, or somewhere else, or South Americans, or wherever, right? This is sort of because, and we get to that in a second, transport costs are less and less of an issue nowadays, we are talking about a very, very global market. And to highlight that, I have another video for you. If you think about it historically, you know, most things uh, didn't travel very far from their point of origin. You know, most people didn't travel very far from where they were born. You know, most products were made locally. A lot of information remained local. Uh, and what we see now is that a lot of these things have become more mobile, people traveling the world, goods being made wherever it's most efficient, information uh, traveling instantaneously around the globe. Um, and it's gotten us to the point where, um, you know, so many things are born global. Uh, there used to be a time when companies could you know, start in one place and, you know, conquer a local market and, you know, hone their skills. And at one point you would take the decision, we're going to expand internationally and, you know, let's go to this market, let's go to that market. And increasingly, um, you know, you're, you're born global. Your products are available in many parts of the world. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity for a lot of companies to get scale fairly quickly. Uh, but of course, it also poses lots of challenges. I mean, one thing that has certainly changed is there are hardly any parts of the world that aren't connected and that aren't plugged in, right? I mean, for a long time when we talked about globalization, it was really, you know, some of the large emerging markets from Asia becoming connected into the global economy. But now all of Africa is connected. You know, most uh, Latin American countries have, have integrated into the global economy. I mean, you, know, you look at the history of globalization and the cost of moving things, physical objects, people, and information has fallen dramatically. But especially over the last 10 to 15 years, you know, you're literally talking about the cost coming down to zero when it comes to information. So our ability to digitize things, not just communications, but even products and services has dramatically increased. And the price of transmitting that has come down to zero. And, you know, sometimes you say, well, is this just a quantitative change or is it a qualitative change? But when you have the cost of global reach approaching zero for a whole lot of things, that is a qualitative change. Okay, so what is the story so far? We talked about globalization as a phenomenon that we observe right now, right? Hopefully you observe that and remember tonight when you get in your PJs, yeah, check it out. Um, but uh, it's, not, it's not just something that has been there for a while. It's actually happening within your lifetime. It's happening within, I don't know, I taught this module the first time two years ago, and bam, things are changing. They are changing so quickly. God, I hate having taken on this module, this lecture, because I have to update it every bloody time. Yeah? So actually, these things change radically. They change radically. And this is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about, where as a good social scientist, you need to take a, stack, uh, you need to take a step backwards. Right? You zoom out of things. You look at things a little bit from an eagle eyes point of view, and then suddenly you see it.
because often you are so involved in it, it's just so normal for you that you go and you buy the cheapest salad, wherever that is coming from. You don't, probably don't even look at it anymore. Yeah? But now you kind of see actually this is a qualitative change that is happening within the last few years. Okay, so why is that happening? Now, why is, you could argue, it's a good reason, why is globalization happening to that degree? And, you know, some of the examples were already brought up or some stuff was already mentioned. So let me now talk about four origins of globalization. First one is pretty straightforward. It's actually improvement in transportation. Yeah. Larger cargo ships. And actually, there's a huge development about that. Well, actually, if you think about the largest cargo ship these days, it's a Chinese company that is running that. They have these containers, these container ships. What do you think how many containers they kind of can put on one of those ships now? Anybody an idea? Yeah? Just throw a number at me. Come on, guys. 200. 200. Huh? Yeah. 1,000? Something else? 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the guy is right. Actually, it's 21,000. So, no, sorry, you were wrong, right? I laughed because your number was so slow. So low. Yeah. <laughs> it's 21,000 20 foot units. That's how these things are called. How big is such a container? It's 7.1 meters long. If I would put them all together in a line, just one container next to the other, that line would be over 125 kilometers long. That's almost the way from Dublin to Belfast. You can get the other side of Ireland with just one bloody container ship. It's incredible. That's sort of massively increased the kind of stuff that is being transported. And because nowadays we're talking about these huge sizes, you know, those ships really like exploded. I don't know, those ships are massively long. Right? I don't know. I don't know, but they're half a kilometer long by itself, the whole thing. Out of steering that thing is quite a challenge. But because they are so, so big, the costs for transpor uh, transportation drop down. Uh, it's economies of scale. You just do more and more and more. That means you can produce, in, in, I don't know, more things with lower costs. And when we look at these statistics in a little more detail, you know, again, apologies, here's the data capped in 2005, but you know, imagine that trend going downwards. So now you see different lines. Again, you see like percentages, like whatever it was in 1930, that was 100%. And now you see the costs of sea freight coming down. So in 2005, it only costs like 20% of what it, I don't know, to transport something. Yeah? The, the transportation costs were only 20% of what they were in 1930. Yeah? And that has only continued to go downwards. You know, I was joking earlier about this thing with international phone calls, but seriously, this is how it used to be. We, remember, we had like these family friends in the US and we made phone calls and it was just bloody expensive. And nowadays, you don't even think about it anymore. Yeah? I don't know, there's not even a difference. And within the European Union, actually, it's legally binding that there is no difference. It doesn't matter whether you call somebody in, I don't know, in Greece or in Sweden or in Northern Ireland. It's exactly the same price. You know, that's sort of just one of the things. Soon, Northern Ireland probably will be more expensive again. But that's their fault. Then they won't get any phone calls from us anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but the costs dramatically dropped down. Let me show you one other thing now. So now I want to show you a little video about actually the amount of transport that's going on. Remember, we were talking about one of those big ships that are having 21,000 containers on it. Yeah. So now you see a map. And you see what those dots mean? That's one <laughs> bloody ship. OK, so now let's see it actually look at the, at the movement of those ships. At any given moment, tens of thousands of giant cargo ships are moving around the world's oceans. These ships, some of which are more than a quarter of a mile long, are the heavy lifters of the global economy, shifting everything from metal ores and compressed gas to fresh fruit and plastic toys. This interactive map shows the movements of the world's commercial shipping fleet in 2012, based on hundreds of millions of individually recorded positions. Plotting all the raw positions at once shows the extraordinary extent of modern shipping's reach. Even without a background map, the world's coastlines are clearly defined, albeit with plenty of variation. From the buzz of activity in the East China Sea, to the relative quiet of Somalia's piracy-afflicted waters. While ships can move freely through the open ocean, routes are predetermined closer to land, and especially in tight straits such as the dual carriageway of the English Channel. 
The most crucial shipping thoroughfares of all, though, are the man-made canals linking different bodies of water, such as the Panama Canal, opened a century ago to connect the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and the even older and busier Suez Canal, which saw 17,000 transits in 2012 alone. In some places, ships penetrate deep into continents via rivers and lakes, such as the massive Paraguay and Amazon rivers in South America, or the Great Lakes in North America, whose ports include Chicago, Milwaukee and Toronto. Colouring the ships by category shows the flows of the global economy in more detail. The red dots are the tankers, which shunt oil from massive terminals in the Middle East or from offshore rigs in West Africa and elsewhere while the blue dots are so-called dry bulk ships, which move aggregates, ores and coal from mines and quarries, many of them found in Australia and Latin America. Many of these raw materials are shipped to manufacturing regions to make finished goods that are themselves then moved back across the ocean in container ships, shown here in yellow. China is the centre of the shipping container world. Shanghai alone moved 33 million units in 2012. While all of this shipping makes modern life as we know it possible, there is a downside. Moving billions of tonnes of ships and cargo relies on burning massive quantities of bunker fuel. The result is a huge amount of carbon dioxide or CO2, the main driver of global warming. Commercial ships produce more than a million tonnes of CO2 every day, more than the whole of the UK or Canada or Brazil. Click around the map to explore the data for yourself or click the info sign for more information about how it was made. Pretty cool websites, I recommend you check it out, shipmap.org, it's pretty cool, uh, what they show there, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, this is jaw-dropping, this is like, uh, on a scale that I didn't even think about, right, on a massive, massive scale, and maybe now this is sort of like, makes sense why all our products are coming from all over the world, right, because we have so much transportation going on, and here, that's another little infograph, you know, that shows the development of container shipments, um, Per, per country, you know, the growth of it. So now, I don't know, you need to think when we reach 100, it means it doubled for that country. If it reaches 200, it means it tripled for that country. If it reaches 300, you know, it quadrupled for that country. And you see the container shipments within the last 15 years for China, they're more than quadrupled. There are more than four times as many container ships now in China than 15 years ago. More than four times. Yeah. I don't know, even for the rest of the world, it's like uh, three times as many. Hmm. A lot of new ships being built. A lot of new ships on our on our oceans. And oh, there's a question. Why is the United States so small and different? Yeah, that's I don't know. Um, maybe because nobody wants to go there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I certainly don't. Yeah. I don't know. Good question. Um, well, probably, um, I, I don't have an explanation for that, but as a good sociologist, you always need to think, you get something like that, and you need to think immediately about three possible explanations. Bang, bang, bang. What are three possible explanations for that? One, you start at a very high level. Yeah? If you kind of start from a lower level, where you were not involved in the global economy, you actually have more potential to increase. So that's probably my best guess at the moment. Right? But um, there could be other reasons for that. Could be taxes. I don't know. There could be could be other things, but you know, my hunch would be because they already were ahead in terms of commercialization, or I don't know, producing and consuming goods. Um, they have less room to improve up there. But that's just a guess. Let's move on to another reason. So we talked about transportation costs at the moment going down. Let's talk about the second one. Well, now we need to talk about the freedom of trade. And we need to talk about those trade agreements that you hear about in the news and ah, maybe you don't really know what the fuck is going on. But uh, these things are actually quite important. So what is a trade agreement? It's basically imagine where countries agree that they can actually exchange goods, yeah, sometimes without tariffs, sometimes without controls at the borders and so on. It just opens up the borders. Yeah? So basically that the Irish farmer can sell the milk or the butter or whatever they produce, that they can sell that in France or in Germany or wherever in the world. Well, wherever in the world, there are sometimes restrictions on that. And if you follow the news, uh, there was something going on between the United States and Canada recently about a new agreement about NAFTA too. It has its own name, Canada, Mexico, US trade agreement, so on, right? And actually a crucial component in that one is that the Americans just wanted to sell more milk in Canada. There was a limit, there was a restriction on how, how much milk can be exported to Canada from the US. You would argue, why is there such a restriction in place to begin with? 
Well, that's in a certain way to protect the local farmers in Canada, right? because otherwise they might not be competitive. Or to give another example, actually before the last six months, I was um, on a visiting professorship in Switzerland at the University of Zurich. Great place, really nice. <laughs> Bloody expensive. <laughs> and, um, and food is crazily expensive. And why is that? Well, it's actually because they're not part of the European Union. So they actually have a lot of tariffs on products like meat or milk or cheese. And why do they do that? Because if they wouldn't do that, those local farmers up in the Swiss mountains, they would have no way of competing with, let's say, the Irish butter. Yeah. Not to say that the Irish butter is cheap, but it is cheap compared to the Swiss one. Yeah. Or to other products produced in, in other parts of Europe. So there you can see, so sometimes there's a reason for that, but these trade agreements, they increased massively. You know, and the biggest one that you, I don't know, that you're all aware of, that's the European Union. Yeah. There's, there are the three freedoms. It's the freedom of, I don't know, personality, of uh, freedom, freedom of people moving around, freedom of goods, and God, what is the third one? I should know, but it drops me. Yeah. Anyway, so there's the freedom to move stuff, actually. So when you're a company producing in one European country, you can sell this in any other, other European country. Yeah. There's no restriction on that. There are no taxes on that. Yeah. There are no tariffs on that at the border. And that's what all the fuss is about, because now when, when the British kind of, in their eternal wisdom, decide to kind of move out, yeah, you have to pay all those tariffs when you kind of ship products back and forth between Belfast and Dublin all the time, which is what you do like five, ten times, fifteen times in the product life cycle of a product. So think about the tariffs that accumulate over here. But that's just one of the problems. There's the whole other things, filling out forms and stuff, you know. Anyway, so freedom of trade. And actually this is a sort of recent phenomenon as well. When you look at the number of trade agreements that have been signed, and this is now what this, what this graph shows you on the right hand side, you see to see the cumulative number of trade agreements for goods, but then also for services. Just look at that. Those agreements really exploded. And there's like bilateral agreements. And actually what the, what the fuzz is that the Brits think they, I don't know, now we want to have our own treaties like that with other countries. So because we don't, we, we, I don't know, they, I don't know, because we could potentially get a better deal yeah, in some ways. But here you see that the amount of trade agreements dramatically increased, which basically lowers the barriers for international trade. Okay, let me move on to a third origin of globalization. Um, let's talk about improvements of communication. Right? Improvements of communication. By that I mean, gosh, is there a change going on? Yeah? The internet, mobile technology. Yeah? And again, these are the kind of things that are sometimes really hard to put in context. Imagine that a couple of years ago, I don't know, is it like five, six years ago, there was no thing like WhatsApp. It wasn't. Yeah. And if you go a little further back, I can't remember on Facebook, I don't know what was founded, but it's actually not that long ago. Yeah. And nowadays these things are Instagram. Yeah. Nowadays these things are part of our life and we use them to communicate. Yeah. I don't know, I'm on Skype all the time with people all over the world. I have collaborators all over the world. Right? It's more like, it's almost like we work on papers 24 hours non-stop because we, we live in different time zones and then we just shift it on to the next one. Right? Uh, so we have a tremendous amount of communications. You know, if you kind of, I don't know, in online gaming, you have people in your clan all over the world. Yeah? They are all come together and there are actually no barriers in these kind of things. And nowadays, you know, even, even um, connection speeds, which used to be a problem, they're not a problem anymore. Yeah? It's almost like, bam, instantaneous, we are there. Or another example where you actually might see how this actually plays out. Nowadays, a farmer, uh, I don't know, this is probably not a farmer in the third world, but think about a farmer somewhere in the third world, can immediately look up the world market price for that rice yeah, or for that grain. They immediately see, should I harvest today, should I not harvest today, and so on. So it's all connected in ways that it wasn't before. Okay, so we have a massive change, to summarize, in transportation. We have a massive change in free trade agreements. We have a massive change in communication technologies, in a way. Now let me talk about a fourth origin for this phenomena of globalization that we have. That's a tremendous change in the availability of labor and skills. Yeah. Nowadays, countries such as India, they have layer labor costs and also high skill levels. You know, now it's not that products are bad anymore. Uh, you know, actually, uh, I really love my underwear from Bangladesh. You know, it's very comfy. Um, I don't know, my phone from China, it's not like, I don't know, Chinese phones used to be, actually, nowadays all phones come from China. Yeah? 
So, uh, and you know, this, this is good quality. Yeah? Or, we, or the opposite, you could say, there used to be these things that cars from Germany used to be high quality, right? Funny story around made in Germany, actually it was made as a deterrent at first. It was introduced as a deterrent. Was it during the First World War, I think? Um, but actually it turned into a, a signal of kind of quality at the end of the day. But nowadays it's not the case anymore. So I have friends driving Volkswagens and I don't know, it breaks down as much as the latest Daihatsu or whatever they are called. So um, we have a change in that regard that we have huge differences in labor costs. And now I'm going to show you a graph about, now this is a bit dated, but from 2010, what it costs to manufacture in certain countries. So you see like, I don't know, US dollars per hour. So it's just an indicator so that you kind of see how much does it actually cost to produce something in one country compared to producing the same product in another country. And uh, when you look at the, the left graph, you know, it's just a couple of selections from the, from the, from the one on the right side. You see there's actually a huge difference between a country like China and, I don't know, you don't want to be in Norway to produce something, right? It's kind of funny that Huda Maki, you know, but maybe it's just a really weird market and nobody else wants to produce those lids. Or maybe it's highly automized. That's what I, my, my suggestion, what my thought is. But there are huge costs in producing stuff. So when you're a company and you produce something, you really want to think about where you produce that. You really want to think about where you put that factory down because it has a huge impact on for how cheap or for how expensive you have to produce and in, in, in consequence for how cheap or how expensive you can sell your product. So there's a massive, massive change in that regard. You know, and um, later on I have uh, a, a little example because there are sort of obviously, obviously huge, uh, huge cons to this as well. Yeah, question? I wanted to ask, uh, what about the environmental costs? Yeah. Because a lot of this um, industrial farming is actually ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also what about the uh, human cost in yeah. reducing uh, labor down to the point where people are living in threatened conditions? Great, guys. You're kind of thinking immediately like I want you to think. Obviously, this has implications. This has implications for society, and they're not just pros to it, right? I don't know, things get cheaper and so on. Actually, there's another side to it. You're mentioning a few. What about those rights of those kids in Bangladesh that produce my underwear? I hope, I hope they were not kids. Yeah. yeah. I, I keep on my underwear for now. But, um, but of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Or think about the environmental costs around that. It's a very good point. Do you think there are these? Do you think there are these regulations in place in third world countries? You know, they're kind of like moving. Well, I don't know. You see this now a little bit happening in China that people are becoming much more aware now of the environmental factors of that, and people actually, you know, they're not they're not always like um, protesting against that. But this brings us to the next topic that I want to talk with you about. I want to talk about you know they're actually not just pros; they're also cons to this. So now I have a little video on that. A Fox News alert, and the protesters are taking to the streets in Hamburg, Germany right now. Uh, these pictures just into us uh, coming in live as protesters there. Basically, anti-globalization forces, as we understand it, are protesting the G20 summit in Hamburg, Germany. Um, some tear gas is being employed. You can see kind of the anti-personnel uh, armored vehicles there, and, and there's some of the, uh, the tear gas that seems to be wafting through the crowds. Obviously, um, a tense time in Hamburg as the leaders of the top 20 economies of the world have gathered there uh, to talk about w the world economic situation and, you know, try to make things better for all of us, but these protesters are having none of it. There go the water cannons, uh, very effective in keeping protesters at bay, knocking them off their feet in a non-lethal way. Uh, that's what often happens. So these, uh, again, the protesters uh, apparently arguing against globalization um, and throwing rocks and bottles at police officers and so forth. This has been happening, well, for the better part of a decade or, or so. If you recall what, what happened when the World Trade Organization came to Seattle, I believe it was. We see this kind of thing time and time again. Yeah, very often you can see an anarchist strain at some of these protests, and clearly the authorities there were ready for this. They did anticipate protests and were ready to, to respond if, in fact, there were some. So this is no surprise, as John, you mentioned, uh, this happens at other big events. 
and uh, we'll be following this uh, as it develops. Supposedly 100,000 protesters will keep an eye on it. Back in just a minute. As world leaders, okay, we, we could go over that, you know, there are more videos about that, but you, you have to give it to Fox News, they are entertaining, you know. Um, but uh, what is the story? This was like the G20 summit that happened last year in Hamburg, in Germany. You know, there's a huge riot. I didn't show you the, I don't know, the riot that was going on during the night. Yeah, and this is like happening there. So what the hell is going on here? Yeah, what is the point? And there I have now a little exercise for you guys. So I want you to discuss in small groups. We're going to take two minutes for that. Small groups, uh, why you think those protesters are so angry. Yeah, think about uh, what kind of are maybe negative sides of the globalization. So go, we talk about it. Okay, guys, let's, let's cut it here. We're running, we're running a bit late, so unfortunately we don't have much more time. So, but still, I want to ask a few of you guys. I don't know what what do you guys come up with? What is your best? Ex I don't know. Yes. Yeah. But they were angry because of the inequality, right? Inequality. Yes, which is happening because of the globalization. Yeah. I would say. So there are people doing very, very fucking hard work, yeah. and they are paid so very little money, yeah. and they are treated so badly, you know. And then you, then you just see that the big corporations are just trying to make the massive money, but they are taking advantage from people who yeah. are actually working pretty hard. Well, actually, it's a point that I have here on my slides as well. You have big companies moving around. They move, they move around, you know, like crazy. They go wherever it's cheapest to produce. This year they produce in India. I don't know, next year it's actually cheap in Bangladesh, so screw India, let's go to Bangladesh. And there we are, there are no rights that are being followed. There is no guarantee that the wealth that is kind of like uh, um, comes from that stays within that community. Actually, oftentimes it happens the opposite. You know, when you think about, I don't know, think about countries like Nigeria, rich on huge amounts of resources of oil, but does anything stay there? No. It all goes to BP, yeah, or somewhere else. There are no taxes there. There's sort of like a, um, 
uh, and another thing about the environmental impacts that we kind of talked about, uh, because there are no um, restrictions, no control, like in like in other countries. So it's kind of nice on paper. Let's say when we are in the European Union, we can enforce certain labor labor rules, but actually on the global scale, we can't, right? Yeah. Massive difference mm -hmm. in treatment of uh, workers and stuff yeah. like that. So there is no equality at all. So we have uh, an absence of laws in that regard, yeah. uh, you know, that are there. We have um, actually even a threat to the cultural diversity as well. Yeah, because those I don't know those locally produced they disappear. I saw this documentary about how suddenly I can't remember which country in Africa it was. They kind of rely on importing grains that they used to produce locally, and the local production kind of died off. Right, because I don't know uh, the other products just came in cheaper in a way, and it destroyed the local economy. And suddenly, people are dependent on on the world trade and are really uh, having a problem. Now, we talked about labor conditions. Talked about labor conditions. Yeah? Um, it's horrible what you see in that regard. Not to say that every every product that has been produced somewhere I don't know in the world being produced in a certain way, but. I don't want to know about my jumpers. I don't want to know. You know, it's actually really sad when you think about it. It's really sad. So I have an, had another video about uh, the, the the production. I don't know the environment in, in a firm. You know, when you have your iPhone, how does it come from, and so on. You don't have the time to run this, so I'm going to put that up on Blackboard for you guys uh, to see uh, the video, nevertheless. Okay. So we actually do have quite a lot of downsides to it. You know, but you know, as a as a social scientist, you know, of course you can have your ideas, and but you need to be objective in some way. So actually, what are you need to at least entertain the thought? Okay, what is actually the pros? What are the cons here? You know, this is sort of what distinguishes us uh, from from um, from uh, being just activists, you know, which is very important. Uh, but we also need to think, okay, what are the other sides? So what are the pro sides of that? Well, free trade is supposed to reduce barriers such as traffic and taxes. Okay. Innovative investment could uh, lead the transnational companies help countries to provide new jobs and skills for local people. Traditional uh, transnational companies could bring wealth and foreign currency to local economies. You know, when they buy local resources, extra money created by this investment can be spent on education, health, infrastructure, for example. Uh, not to say that these things, I don't know, maybe it's just the challenge for us to make these things work. Right? We cannot stop globalization from happening anymore. That ship has sailed, guys. That ship has sailed with 21,000 bloody containers on it. Huh? That's gone. I, I tried to stop that tanker. Huh? That's, uh, uh, I don't know, it's not going to happen. Right? So actually, it's our challenge. That's, uh, I think, a huge challenge. That's, that's why we end up in society challenges. It's a challenge to deal with this. It's your challenge to deal with this. Yeah? How we can affect that. What are other things that I don't think could have positive impacts here? You know, the sharing of ideas. Yes, actually, it could happen, you know, like, I don't know, bring that knowledge uh, to other countries. It's joint ventures, it happens sometimes, you know, that then countries have locally the, the, the knowledge or the technology to do certain things, right? Just thinking, I don't know, we block everything, ah, it's not going to work either, yeah? So you have a transfer of technology, of knowledge that is happening. We could actually be aware of, and we are, much more aware of global events, if nowadays there's an earthquake happening in Indonesia, it's all over the news, right? Which probably wasn't the case like 30, 40 years ago, you know why. So globalization may help to make people more aware of global issues such as deforestation or global warming and so on and so forth. Right? So if we didn't okay. have so much globalization, we probably wouldn't be hearing all about the disasters. Because they're actually making the disasters. Yeah, well, that's a... Our seas and our yeah. skies and yeah. with globalization, this word is just being banded around now. It's a yeah. word. Well, there's, there are different yeah. arguments about that. You could argue, I don't know, are there suddenly more earthquakes happening because of globalization? Probably not, right? But maybe there are more people affected by it. Uh, but we hear about it in a way. But I see your point, you know, that maybe we're sort of like involved in that, in environmental catastrophes and so on. But probably there are other disasters that we were not aware of, and I don't know, people didn't receive help in a way. There's nobody stepping in, nobody intervening, and so on. Yeah. Okay, I had a lot of other things about Ireland, but we have to skip about that. I don't know, I had other things about some other challenges. Basically, I don't know, some, just, I, I could have a whole lecture on this, guys, seriously. This is like, I think this is so, so exciting. This is so exciting, and this is actually crazy to think about. I don't know, about diseases, how they spread nowadays. Just think about Ebola that we had, uh, um, I don't know, two years ago. 
uh, think about other diseases, swine flu, I don't know, bread flu, whatever they are called, because we are so connected with each other, these things spread in ways, and there's another doomsday video about how there's going to be a pandemic at some point in the world. I'm trying to put it up on YouTube to watch that later on, but um, it is a massive challenge. So anyway, guys, so other uh, things. So um, I hope you kind of got now aware of the issue of globalization. If you like this, uh, there are other lectures in the School of Sociology that you can choose over the next few years. I wish you all the best. Good luck with the rest of the module.